Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tamal. I'm the founder and CEO of Apps Code. So today we are going to talk about how you can manage many Kubernetes clusters using Open Cluster Management Project. So typically uh, on this in this webinar session, we will talk about various projects that we have been working on. But today is a special one because we are talking about a cloud native project from the uh, CNCF ecosystem. So Open Cluster Management Project is uh, a project that's been uh, under development uh, by Red Hat and Alibaba and many other companies in the space. And this project is, uh, uh, yeah, so this project is kind of focuses on how you can manage a large number of Kubernetes clusters, which could be on a same cloud or a multiple different cloud or on-prem. Now, uh, you know, if you look at it today, today there is no one unified way how you can manage many different clusters across this, uh, you know, different vendors or providers. And uh, this OCM project or the Open Cluster Management Project tries to provide a few important, uh, you know, primitives, API primitives, so that uh, a, so this kind of use cases can be facilitated. So the focus of this project is to provide a framework with the key missing APIs that are missing from the, the upstream Kubernetes but that addresses this particular use case where we are dealing with uh, multiple clusters across different clouds. Now the, the key APIs that uh, they provide are kind of in the three category. So the first one is uh, cluster inventory. So here we're talking about not just one cluster, but many, many clusters, you know, in, uh, in the range of like thousands of clusters. I mean, the, the OCM project itself has been tested against 2000 clusters. Uh, so, so you need a way to sort of maintain an inventory of them, right? Like some place where you can see what are the different clusters that are connected. So that's the cluster inventory management. And then uh, the workload placement. When you have so many clusters, you need a way to place your workloads, like your deployments, pods, stateful sets, et cetera, on one or one a subset of these clusters. So that's the workload placement. Uh, and then the uh, workload distribution, the actual uh, uh, mechanism, how you distribute the workload from a kind of a central place, they call it a hub cluster, to this individual uh, managed clusters or this spoke clusters. So, so if I go back again, so essentially there is a way to manage, uh, keep inventory of these clusters. There is a way you can select one or more of these clusters, and then uh, you can distribute your workload across these clusters. Now, the mechanism that, or the architecture that uh, OCM project follows is a hub and spoke model. So you know, we are all familiar with the hub and spoke model, right? Like if you have a, like a bicycle wheel, you have the central hub, and then there's all the spokes, which are all pointed to the edge. So similar thing here, right? So you have this one central cluster uh, through uh, which is kind of works as the control plane for this, all these other clusters that are going to be managed. And then uh, you connect uh, each of these spoke cluster or managed clusters to this hub cluster. And once those are connected, uh, the hub cluster can be used by one or more human admins to manage these managed uh, clusters. So essentially you do not need to do anything on those managed clusters directly anymore. You can do everything direct through this hub cluster. Uh, so this is kind of what the, you know, a uh, little bit the struct architecture looks like. So the hub cluster is the management control plane for the uh, deployment uh, for this uh, multi-cluster architecture. And then on each of the uh, managed cluster, uh, it runs a component called cluster lit, right? So if you're familiar with something like the, the uh, upstream Kubernetes, what happens? You have the kube API server, and then each node, the worker nodes get a uh, kubelet. So here, uh, the hub cluster gets the cluster manager, and other add-ons uh, like policy add-ons or application add-ons, or you can write your custom add-ons. Those are in the management cluster uh, or the hub cluster. And then uh, each of the managed cluster uh, or spoke clusters, they get the clusterlet. And those things run like uh, the registration AP agent and then work agent. So essentially they are running a number of agents uh, that will receive the, so the prescriptions or the, you know, the, resources from the hub cluster and apply them on the managed cluster. 
So this is a clearly uh, pool-based model, right? So uh, in a deployment like this, only sort of the accessible IP address that is required is for the hub cluster. So the hub cluster's API address needs to be accessible by all these managed clusters, but the managed clusters can be on a edge location or on a private network where it's not able to, it's not accessible from outside. Now, this is the first part of our demo. So here, what I'm going to do is show you how we can connect uh, a set of clusters like this. So to do that, I'm going to go back to my shell. Uh, so I hope you can see my screen. Maybe I'll expand, make it a little bit bigger. Yes. So what I have here is I have uh, uh, three clusters. So these are uh, standard kind clusters that I have created. So uh, just a kind create cluster like this. So and give it a name. So I get name and then the, the two sort of the managed clusters, I gave them name C1 and C2. And uh, now if we go to the hub cluster, we can see what's there, kubectl get nodes. Uh, it's just a standard cluster. So we have only one node. And uh, if we look at what's installed here ahead of time, uh, so, uh, you know, it doesn't have anything special installed. There is only thing, one thing I have installed ahead of time in these clusters, which we'll need later is the Flux CD. So, so I have installed the Flux CD using the Flux CD uh, CLI, and it has the Helm controller and the source controller for Flux CD install. And uh, same for the all the managed clusters. So let's say if we go to C1, we can also see what's there. Uh, yeah, it's just, just the basic cluster running uh, with the Flux CD pre-installed. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, if we want, we can just take a look at C2 also. Same thing. Okay. Now, with that, let's go back to the hub cluster because most of our activity will be done from the hub cluster. So now we are back to the hub cluster. And now, what do you want to do? This uh, OCM project. Uh, provides a uh, CLI called cluster ADM. So we're going to run this command. So cluster ADM init and wait. So this process is going to essentially turn this hub cluster, we, you know, the name, it was just the name we gave, but it will actually deploy the, uh, many, uh, the, uh, the control planes needed for making it a hub cluster. It's gonna take a few minutes to essentially uh, run the components it needs. And yeah, so it's done. And uh, so the cluster is now a hub. So we can see what it has done. Uh, if we run the kubectl get uh, namespace, we can see that it has created two the these namespaces, two of these new namespaces. And uh, if we go to this, uh, namespaces, we can see what's running there. So here you'll see it's running this cluster manager component. And then if you go to the hub uh, namespace, you'll see that it is running those basic features that it supports. So there's obviously a couple of webhook related pods, but the main thing is that it has this uh, registration controller. So which is in charge of basically accepting connection from these managed clusters. And then the placement controller, which does the you know placement of these uh, workloads across these uh, clusters, and this will this has also installed a number of uh, uh, CRDs. So if you go there, you'll see that it has installed uh, quite a few CRDs here. Now one of the interesting thing is it has a if you do kubectl get cluster manager, so it has created this uh, cluster manager object, and this can be used to configure or kind of en enable various features of the 
hub cluster. And, and at this time, we do not have anything else, but uh, once we add some managed cluster, we should also see some managed cluster here. Okay, so now uh, what you want to do is connect them, uh, connect one of this, uh, both of those uh, managed clusters to this hub cluster. To do that, we'll need the, uh, that command that we saw. So this command is kind of, if you are familiar with like a cube ADM, which is used to provision Kubernetes. So this is kind of like that. So this is a cluster ADM, but you had as a similarly uh, join command. So we're going to go and take this command. So we switch to the, uh, one of those managed cluster C1, run this command from the context of the managed cluster that we want to manage. So basically, and we give the same name. So since we are on the C1, so cluster name C1. And then because we are running from, uh, uh, running it as a kind cluster, we need to pass it a flag. I'll just copy it because I don't uh, remember it. So if you go to the documentation, you'll see this line, uh, force internal report, yes. So once this is running, uh, the components needed for the uh, uh, spoke cluster or the managed cluster has already been deployed, right? So, and then now we have to go back to the hub cluster and accept it from there. So it's kind of a double opt-in, right? So the uh, managed cluster makes the request and then the uh, hub cluster have to accept it. Yeah, so it is a bit of a delay, but now it's accepted, right? So, so the way uh, this double opt-in or uh, handshaking process works is basically, it uses the Kubernetes uh, CSR API, the certificate signing request API. So essentially there is a bootstrap token that is used that's provided here, which is used by the uh, managed cluster to connect to this uh, hub cluster. And then, then it essentially, you know, makes a CSR request, certificate signing request, and which once gets approved, there is a client uh, certificate created. And that client certificate is now used by the, uh, the managed cluster to essentially connect to it, right? So that's how the communication is established. Now, uh, this, uh, now, if we look at the, uh, on the hub cluster, we are still on the hub cluster. If you look at the number of namespaces, we'll see something interesting. Now there is a new namespace that has been created with the name C1, which matches the managed cluster's name. So this, this na uh, namespace is called a cluster namespace. Basically for every managed cluster that is connected to the hub cluster, there will be a namespace created with the matching name. And, and this is how, if you like, if you want to pass any workload to any of the managed cluster, then essentially you have to go to the namespace of the uh, cluster namespace of that uh, managed cluster and create uh, workloads. So the actual type of workloads will come into that later, but it's called manifest work, but we have to do that. So now we'll just go ahead and do the same for uh, the C2 cluster. So here uh, we run the same join command, but this time we're going to call it uh, C2. And then we again go back to uh, up cluster. And accept it. Uh, maybe it takes a minute to pair that. So the CSR request is now created and we have this uh, C2 cluster also connected here. And, and then like again before, uh, if we do kubectl get namespace on the hub cluster, now we see that we have another uh, namespace called C2 that has been created. And if we also look at the K get uh, kubectl get managed clusters, we can also see that from the hub clusters point of view, now there are two uh, clusters C1 and C2 uh, that are uh, you know accepted by the hub and and you can see their names. Um, so this is uh, the kind of the first part of the uh, demo where essentially we have now established 
this uh, kind of a hub and spoke model uh, from the hub cluster, we have two uh, managed clusters that are connected. Now we can go back to the kind of the concepts or the resource types that are available uh, in these by provided by the OCM. So we already saw cluster manager, as I said, this is kind of a uh, configuration object uh, for uh, OCM. Uh, so the hub cluster control plane components can be, uh, you know, various features can be enabled or disabled through this. We already saw the managed cluster uh, custom resource uh, object and the, the cluster namespace that's been created for it. And then there is this concept of manifest work. So what this means is that when you want to uh, pass some work, meaning like we want to create, let's say deployment or an namespace or anything, any Kubernetes resource you want to create on the managed cluster, uh, you have to create a custom resource with this uh, kind, manifest work. And in the body of that uh, manifest work, you provide the different types of resources that you want to create. And, and then you create this manifest work object in, in one of the cluster namespace where you want uh, this work to be basically manifested. So this is kind of a request you are asking Hub to say, okay, hey, manifest this thing. So once this is created, it will be watched by the uh, managed cluster and that will actually go and provision those objects. Uh, so then there is this concept of a cluster set. Uh, so by default, uh, you know, uh, when OCM works, uh, like here we have created two clusters. So by default, if you go to uh, the cluster and run a command like uh, cluster ADM get cluster set, you'll see that uh, there are two cluster set that are already created. So there is the one cluster set, which is called global. And this cluster set has this special property that all the connected clusters uh, will always be a member of this uh, cluster set. So in this case, we have two clusters, C1 and C2. So they are member of this global cluster set. And then uh, there is another cluster set, which is called a uh, default. And this will be member of uh, a, any cluster, any cluster set that is not member of any other custom cluster set will be uh, the member of the default name is uh, default cluster set. So, so it's kind of essentially a default catch-all cluster set uh, for all the cluster sets that are not uh, part of any special subset. And then you can also see that there is this concept of a bounded namespace. Uh, so right now there is no bounded namespace, but we are going to go and create some bounded namespace. So the idea is that, okay, like if we want to think about this, right? So we have this multiple clusters that are connected. Now, when you want to create a, uh, some workload in those clusters, what I said is that, okay, we can go ahead and create this manifest work object there. Now you can imagine like if you have a lot of these clusters, you do not want to go ahead and create those manifest work objects in each of those uh, cluster namespaces for like C1, C2 individually, right? You want a way where you can say, okay, I have this subset of clusters and I want uh, this type of application to be deployed there. And, and and you basically place them on that. So that's, that's when uh, that particular instruction that you want to provide, the resources that you have to create for that, that will be created in a namespace that is bounded for this cluster set. And that, that namespace is actually called a workspace namespace. So this is kind of a conceptual term, but it is going to be bounded with uh, one of these uh, cluster set. Uh, so the two other objects that we're going to see is now is this the placement object. So which is used to essentially select a cluster set and uh, one or more cluster set and then a subset of their clusters or all of their clusters. So it has essentially like Kubernetes. It has all those uh, label selector or tain toleration type of mechanism. So you can really make your cluster selection very dynamic. Uh, in today's demo, we're going to keep things simple. So we're just you know, going to create a two separate cluster set 
and, and just use them uh, to deploy the different types of applications. So essentially our placement will be select all the clusters in that specific cluster set. And then uh, there is this concept of manifest work replica set. So it is kind of like, you know, the replica set that you get in um, Kubernetes. So the thing that I was saying, right? Like we do not want to go ahead and create this manifest work for each of the clusters by hand. So to facilitate that, you have the manifest work replica set. So this one is actually a combination of a placement uh, uh, resource and a template manifest resource. And uh, all the clusters that will be selected by this placement will get a manifest work that will be generated from this manifest replica set template. So we're going to now go and actually see some real example and, and we'll understand how this all works. So, so with that, I'm going to jump into the demo a bit more. Uh, so what we can do is uh, we can create a cluster set. Uh, let's call it app one. So uh, just to be clear, this is all going to be done from the hub cluster, right? So we are not really going to do anything from the managed clusters anymore. So we have created the cluster set app one, right? If you, uh, and, and then add a cluster to that. Maybe just, uh, yeah. So we're going to add C1 cluster to this. And now if we run the cluster set, uh, uh, ADM get cluster sets, you'll see what's going on, right? Now you see that before, because C1 and C2 was not part of any custom cluster set, they were both part of the default and they are always part of the global. Now they are still always part of the global because this is contains everything, but now C1 is part of the uh, app one, this custom cluster set and, uh, and C2, only C2 is left in the default cluster set because C2 hasn't been made part of any custom uh, cluster set. So we're going to just go ahead and uh, also make uh, C2 part of a custom cluster set. So, so now you can see that the default uh, cluster set uh, is empty. Now uh, app one has the C1 cluster and app two has the C2 cluster. So what I'm trying to simulate a scenario is that, let's say I have different types of application that I want to deploy in different subset of my clusters. So in this case, app one, uh, uh, application one, this is a cluster set that will have the C1 cluster and I'm going to deploy app one there. And then app two will be deployed in this other cluster, uh, C2 cluster set. So now uh, we're going to go and create those workspace uh, namespaces. So for app one, it will be app one and for app two will be app two. And then we have to bind it to the uh, cluster set. So this is the command. So now if we run the uh, get cluster set again, now we see some additional data, right? So as you can see before uh, C1 didn't have any bounded namespace. Now C1 does have a uh, bounded namespace here. So the C1 has a bounded namespace of app one. C2 has a bounded namespace of app two and uh, default is again, uh, stays empty. And global is, uh, has two clusters, but has no bounded namespace. So we're going to go ahead and create some bounded namespace also for uh, uh, global uh, one. So we're going to create two namespaces, uh, kubedb and kubeops, uh, and then bind them to the uh, cluster set global. Okay, so now uh, we have this uh, cluster set kubedb and kubox. They are both bound into the uh, global namespace. Uh, sorry, the global cluster set. And, and and as usual, these are just standard namespaces, as you can see. Like I have this uh, uh, f one f two namespace, and then also the kubedb and kubox namespace. Okay. Now, now that this is all uh, configured, what I'm going to do is I want to create. Uh, or deploy our kubedb operator in all these clusters. And to do, the, to do that, I'm going to essentially use the global cluster set. So I have created a placement object and all I've told it is that, uh, you know, your, my cluster set is going to be the global. So as you can see, this is an array. So you can, you know, have a multiple 
more complex scenarios where you uh, want to select like a subset of cluster set or things like that, you can do that. And then you can also specify only a subset of the clusters from that sub cluster set. In our case, we're just keeping it simple. We are going to deploy it across my you know, whole cluster set, right? The, the global cluster set. So all the clusters in the global cluster set. And so is that's just that. And then in the, if you go to the manifest work, so this is what a manifest work looks like. It's a manifest work replica set. So in the manifest work replica set, what I'm saying is that, okay, this is going to be created in the CubeOps namespace, which is one of the work space namespace for the global cluster set that we just created, right? We bounded it here. And uh, we want to use the placement ref global. So that's the global uh, placement. Uh, and then this is where our uh, actual uh, work is uh, happening. So this is the manifest work template. There are additional uh, configuration options that you can do. Uh, we're not going to go into that today, but uh, effectively, you know, what happens when things get deleted and then uh, the, the hub cluster, sorry, the spoke clusters, they can also pass side in. By default, they will pass some uh, sort of status data back into the hub, but you can also customize what is passed back there. So that's kind of what's called like a feedback rule. Uh, so here, what we are want to do is in each of the managed cluster, which is C1 and C2 in our case, we're going to create a namespace QOps there. And then we are going to create a Helm repository custom resource, which is provided by the Flux CD, right? So in this particular case, as you know, remember, uh, we already uh, deployed the Flask CD operator uh, in that, those clusters ahead of time. Uh, so, so we are with this CRD is already there, or custom resource is already there. So we're going to create a, a Prometheus stack, uh, a custom resource for the Prometheus stack, uh, the Helm repository for that one. And then going to deploy the Prometheus stack. So that's a Helm release. And this one has the, you know, the latest Prometheus stack version using this. And it will be deployed in the monitoring namespace. And this namespace will be created automatically because we said it okay, created. And then we are going to also create a Helm repository for the apps code uh, Helm charts. So that's the Helm chart uh, registry that we offer. And, and then we're going to int install an interesting component, which is our license proxy server. If you are familiar with like a KubeDB, you know that uh, to install KubeDB, you need a license key. And then license key is actually bound to the cluster where it is uh, KubeDB is deployed, which is great uh, for, uh, you know, if you have a, just a one or two cluster that you want to manually deploy. But in a scenario like this, where you are looking to deploy across many, many clusters, uh, you know, cannot manually get the licenses by hand and then deploy it here, right? So we want to automate the process of acquiring those licenses. So that is exactly what is done by this license proxy server. So this is a component uh, or we offer. So this uh, component has a token and then token is actually bound to one of the accounts on our sort of the platform, the Byte Builders platform that we offer. So essentially through that, uh, we will be able to issue new licenses uh, that will be tied to a specific, uh, you know, account, right? So specific organization. And then if you are a paid customer, then it automatically knows for how much duration, you know, like when your actual license expires. So, you know, it's not a, just a fixed, like a uh, three day or five day license or 30 day license, right? It will actually be tied to the duration for which you currently have a uh, subscription with us. So this is going to be deployed there. And then where there's the last component, we are going to also deploy our KubeDB operator. And for the KubeDB operator, it's going to be also, we're just going to deploy a subset of the components, but you know, uh, just good enough for today's demo, but you can install this and you can frankly install anything else you need, right? Like you want to install Stat, you want to install Grafana or other various other things, Start Manager. You can imagine that this technique can be used to deploy all of them across all this cluster set. So with that, I'm going to just uh, apply these YAMLs. So, YAML, YAM. Yeah, so I'm going to, uh, just to make sure I'm still on the hub cluster and then kubectl apply minus F, your works, uh, both of them. 
Okay, so now I have created a uh, placement and I've created a, uh, the, the manifest replica set, manifest work replica set. So, so when you create a placement object, the decision that is taken by the hub control plane will be reflected into a new type of resource, which is called a placement decision. So we can see what's uh, happening here. So in the placement decision object, uh, it had the status, you can see that it has selected both of our clusters because, and as I said, we just said, okay, take the global cluster set and select everything. Okay. Now, uh, this manifest replica, uh, re manifest work replica set, as I said, that this is going to, what is going to do, right? It's going to create the manifest work uh, I guess it's still uh, doing this thing. Uh, it is going to clear those manifest work across all the uh, clusters. Okay, so I, I missed one thing here. So this manifest work replica set is actually a relatively new feature for OCM. So to use this, uh, this needs to be activated. So we're going to use that uh, cluster manager to activate this, okay? So essentially what we need to do, we need to go and edit the cluster manager. Uh, and then uh, here in the spec section, we need to add this space. Okay, so once this is activated, we can see what it is doing. It has actually uh, created if this two new components. It has created this uh, work uh, controller in the management hub. Uh, hub. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so it's restarted it and created. Now, now if we run this kubectl get manifest work, now we can see that the manifest replica template that we offered, this manifest work template that we offered in the manifest work replica set, now it has been reflected in each of the cluster namespaces that were selected by this placement decision. So basically both C1 cluster and C2 cluster now got a manifest work and, and it's already there. Now, uh, what's going to happen, right? This is going to get reflected on the workload clusters or the managed clusters. So if we now go to C1, so what we should expect, right? We should expect this uh, Helm charts and Helm releases that we just created here. So if we do get Helm uh, uh, repositories, as you can see, now we have to Helm repository, I mean, we already created this QOps uh, namespace, right? We just created the QOps namespace and also created the QDB and then the monitoring namespace already created. It has the Helm repositories here. And then uh, if we look at the Helm releases, those are also created and they are now, you know, reconciling a stage. So basically the license proxy server has already been reconciled. And then the kubedb and the uh, Prometheus stack uh, that's getting uh, reconciled. So basically, if we do Helm ls, uh, this is one of the nice thing about Flux CD is that uh, you know it, it actually kind of shows the Helm chart that is actually getting getting installed. Unlike let's say Argo CD, where you cannot really see what's going on, uh, it's just uh, converts everything into a template. So now we have to wait a few minutes. Uh, to see this uh, getting done. I mean, in the meantime, we can go ahead and actually take a look at the other cluster, uh, the uh, C2 cluster. And we should see the same thing there also. So if you look at the namespace, uh, you can see that it now has the kubedb namespace, kubeops namespace and the monitoring namespace. It has the same Helm repository. So both of them there. And then okay, get Helm releases. So same thing, these are under reconciliation now. 
So we just have to wait for that to be ready. Dash and monitoring. We can see the Prometheus stack containers are getting created, right? It's going to take a few minutes. If we look at the kubedb, yeah, the kubedb pods are running. And then if we also look at the license status, right? So this is the piece that the license proxy offers because it is able to dynamically uh, get a license. It has got a license for, and it was uh, for the kubedb product. And it was requested by the this uh, service account, which is the QDB provisional service account, and and uh, you know this is valid for this license is valid for basically three days. So by default, what the license proxy does, it gets a three day valid license, and then uh, before it expires, it gets a new license. So essentially, it it gets a, like a short, very short lifespan uh, license. But the in in this particular setup, we have like our contract set up for I think fifty three years or something. So basically it's valid for a long period of time. So, you know, within that period, every three days, it is going to get a new license and get to be make it available. And which is all uh, sort of transparent to the actual running kubedb pod. So, so, so you'll not see any downtime or outage or anything. It's just going to be automatically getting updated back in the behind the scene. Uh, and this, this uh, short uh, license also addresses a concern or issue that we have today, which is like, if you want to migrate a license from one cluster to another, there is no real way to, like, we just have to issue a new license, no way to expire the old one because the licenses are uh, PKI public certificates. So with this, uh, because it's a, uh, in a short lifespan, uh, it gets expired after three days, right? So when you move it to a new cluster, the old certificate will be you know, not usable after three days. Okay, so if we look at it, uh, I guess still uh, going on. Um, yeah, I mean, just a lot of pods running on the same machine. So maybe it takes a few minutes to get everything going. If we go back to the C1 cluster, maybe we can take a look what's going on there. So yeah, so it's still uh, coming up. We should see what's going on with this one. It should be a warning, not an error. Wait for this to be all done. So uh, maybe as this is happening in the background, uh, I can uh, move along uh, in the interest of time. So, so the next step that we want to do is basically uh, create uh, two apps. So we created these two uh, sort of app uh, one and app two cluster set. So what, one thing we want to do is in the app one cluster set only has the cluster C1 and then app two has the cluster C2. And in each one of them, we want to deploy different apps. So in our case, these apps are essentially different databases. So we're going to just uh, in uh, app for app one, we're going to create a Postgres object with a 13.3. And for uh, app two, we are going to create a MySQL object with uh, app two, yeah, with 8.0.29. So the QDB uh, CRDs are ready. Maybe we're going to go ahead and do it. Yeah. We're going to just ignore that warning or error for now. Uh, so if we go back to the hub uh, and uh, for app one, we are now going to apply app one. So apply F2. Okay. So, so if we go back, wait. 
die through this. As you can see that the in the C1 cluster, now we have a Postgres uh, provisioning. And, uh, yeah, give it a uh, give it a few minutes. Everything to be uh, up and running. Yeah, it's coming up. And then uh, if we go to the C2 cluster. Yeah, we have a MySQL uh, up and running here. Uh, well, not up and running yet, but it's going to be up and running soon. Uh, and um, yeah, so it has the MySQL uh, stateful set uh, created and then and the form stuff. So, so, so this is kind of the, you know, sort of the uh, pretty much the, sort of the live demo part of today's webinar. What you are seeing is that Using this hub uh, and uh, managed clusters, we are able to deploy some types of application everywhere. And, and in this particular case, we actually used the Helm charts to deploy them because we have a Flux CD installed on those individual clusters also. Uh, and, uh, and, and we use the Flux CD concepts like Helm release and Helm uh, repository to essentially provision those. So you can imagine in a like a large deployment, you can use this technique to essentially deploy your required components, right? Like this kind of operators, maybe other stuff, SART manager. I mean, if you are doing some backup stuff, like, you know, various kind of required components that are required for a management of a cluster or a, a sort of uh, running a cluster, you deploy it and you place it in the global uh, uh, kind of cluster set. So it's basically deployed everywhere and then for each type of application that you want to run, uh, you use a placement to select those and then uh, deploy your applications into that. And just to be clear, in this case, you know, uh, if we actually go back to the uh, hub cluster and uh, look for that manifest work, as you can see that uh, we have a manifest work uh, replica set. So we have three manifest work replica set. For the first one, app one, it has been created into this, uh, created this manifest work in the C1 cluster. Uh, the app two has created this in the C2 cluster. And then the operators one that was on the global uh, cluster set uh, that has created one manifest work in each of these clusters. So, so if you have like multiple different apps, let's say you have an app three that you want to pass to maybe C1 cluster so you can create essentially another manifest uh, replica set and deploy it there. Now, obviously here, because we have only one uh, cluster uh, in the uh, app one cluster set, you could just directly use a manifest to work. But let's say in a real world scenario, you have multiple uh, clusters in a cluster set so then you are better off using a manifest work replica set to manage them all together. So that's kind of, uh, uh, you know, the overall uh, demo today. And, uh, you know, you can uh, obviously visit the Open Cluster Manager project and uh, try out these various concepts. Uh, now, one thing uh, I would want to end here is with, uh, end here with is the question of uh, like, you know, this looks a lot like what GitHub should be done, uh, used to for, uh, and uh, why are we using the, uh, something like OCM, right? So I think uh, the thing is this uh, OCM and GitOps, those are not uh, like a competitive, but they are rather complementary to each other. So you can imagine like, let's say you have like a lot of clusters, right? Hundreds of clusters, maybe thousands of them. Uh, you know, GitOps has no way of maintaining an inventory of them, right? They are all like, uh, you know, you have to have GitOps configured on each one of them individually. Uh, with the OCM, you have this inventory, right? The hub cluster knows every managed cluster. And, and then you, all the thing you need to do is basically control everything through the hub cluster, right? So in the hub cluster, you tell what needs to happen. It passes it to the managed clusters. So that's a one benefit. Uh, that's what that's kind of the additional feature that OCM provides that you know just a brandy like GitHub doesn't have. And then the other thing is uh, the mm, with GitOps, 
all the placements are static, right? Like you have a Git repo, it goes to all the clusters that are connected. Uh, or if you want to do any uh, uh, subset of the placement, then that is also sort of static. And you have to manually ahead of time know where, what thing goes where and it gets deployed. But uh, you know we haven't gone into that uh, much in today's uh, webinar, but the placement uh, concept or the uh, API has a lot of functionality around kind of selecting a subset of cluster based on their availability, uh, available resources and things like that. So you can use those concepts to sort of dynamically select a subset of clusters. So that's another uh, additional thing that uh, OCM provides. And then the lastly, I would say that the scalability concerns that you may have, uh, I think uh, plays into this. Uh, I know, I mean, obviously I haven't tried with a lot of clusters, so, but I would say that it's not probably practical to actually have like a, you know, 200 as I'll say hundreds or thousands or 2000s of clusters connected to a single Git repo and all doing like a polling because Git doesn't have any kind of watch operation. So it basically everybody has to poll to see what the latest update and get that and all of that, which might put a lot of strain on a Git repo. Compared to that, uh, you can use something like a uh, OCM where, you know, this thing has been tested for 2000 clusters. I mean, you know, you can try, but essentially the limitation seems to be around HCD, how much HCD can take. Uh, so as long as HCD can do it, uh, it's doable. Uh, so you can do a lot of clusters. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, uh, you know, so ultimately, if you think about it, uh, instead of having a single Git repo that goes to all these clusters, a better way to do it will be have a Git repo that only can be used GitOps against the uh, hub cluster. So basically all the resources, this you know YAMLs that I created today and applied to the hub cluster, you can potentially put them in a Git repo and then use that to essentially, essentially sync into your hub cluster. And then let the OCM take care of kind of uh, you know distributing and uh, pushing out these workloads into these uh, managed cluster management clusters uh, managed clusters and, and and that that part is not uh, dependent on git anymore but that is going to be pulled from some external resource right in this particular case we pulled from an external helm chart you can decide how you want to do it right you don't have to essentially do a helm chart you can create a, like a deployment directly things like that right i mean essentially uh, here, you know, I'm there, like I have created a manifest here, a namespace here. You can get a deployment or a service account or things like that. So, so, so if you want to use GitOps with the OCM, that is still sort of doable. Uh, but the topology more looks like the hub cluster gets managed with uh, GitOps, and then everything else kind of goes downstream through OCM. Uh, so that's kind of covers pretty much uh, my uh, webinar today. Uh, and uh, if you go into their website, you will find that they have some additional concepts like add-ons. So what this means is like, you know, today uh, I took a shortcut, which is like a, the Flux CD was manually installed ahead of time uh, in each of these clusters. But uh, you can essentially write like add-on where you take the Flux CD uh, Helm chart and turn that into a OCM add-on. And then you will be able to essentially even deploy Flux CD itself from the uh, hub cluster, essentially enable that add-on and when you enable that add-on, it will get deployed to all these connected uh, managed clusters. So this is a technique that you can use to provision any of these kind of uh, core components. And uh, OCM project itself uh, offers a number of uh, add-ons, uh, uh, things like, uh, so they have some integration for uh, Argo CD, uh, there is a concept, uh, they, they have something called like a cluster proxy. So essentially uh, using cluster proxy, what you can do is you can connect to any of the workload clusters, uh, the managed clusters from the uh, cluster, uh, the hub cluster itself. Then like same thing for uh, service account. So like create a service account uh, in the hub cluster, but that gets created and sort of sync into all these other clusters. So things like that you can automate and, and, and they have some additional functionality. Into this. And then there is also some governance and policy uh, features here. Uh, if you are interested, go ahead and take a look at those. So, so with that, uh, I would uh, open up for any questions you may have and, uh, and thank you for your time.